Okay, cool. Uh, hey guys, we are group 10 and we're doing pathogenic bacteria. Uh, next slide. Cool. So a little bit of uh, background information about bacteria. So bacteria as a whole is part of the three domain systems alongside archaea and eukarya. Bacteria are described as prokaryotic, meaning they have no um, nuclear envelope or organelles. Uh, what is unique about bacteria is that within their cell walls, they contain peptidoglycan, which is which isn't found in uh, eukarya or archaea. So it's something specific to bacteria. Um, they reproduce asexually by binary fission. There are three general shapes that bacteria can come. So cocci or cocus, which is spherical, which you can see the little like picture on the right corner, the blue, uh, blue cocci. There's basilisk, which is rock shape, which is the green shapes right here. And then there's spirulum, which is spiral shape, which is the red, uh, red bacteria. Within bacteria, there are two different types. Um, there's gram negative and gram positive. This is through the staining process. So you know if it's a gram negative, if it is uh, pinkish or red in color, that signifies that it has a thin peptidoglycan wall with an outer lipopolysaccharide, uh, outer membrane. It is positive if it has a thick peptidoglycan wall or on the gram staining process, it's purple. And next slide. All right, so here we have, um, this is just kind of a slide that's uh, kind of describing that millions of people die every year to bacteria. Um, some of the most common are Streptococcus, Pseudomonas, or Shigella. Um, there's a variety and uh, of more pathogenic bacteria. Um, most pathogenic bacteria require living hosts to survive, um, which in return causes much of our diseases. Um, as bacteria replicate, they infect the individuals, and as they increase in numbers, the severity of the disease also increases. Um, a large majority of the individuals who die from these bacteria do not have access to medical care to receive antibiotics to help them. Uh, one part of pathogenic bacteria that is universal throughout all species is their ability to adapt, um, their constant ability to overcome their weaknesses. Um, these are known as their virulence factors, um, which will be discussed more in further slides. So what is pathogenic bacteria? They are more commonly known as, uh, uh, well, pathogenic bacteria, but they're also known as pathogenic uh, prokaryotes or pathogens. Um, they are, bacteria that are capable of spreading diseases. About half a million of known diseases um, came from them. There are three types of bacteria that spread diseases. So there's intracellular, um, which causes diseases when they enter the body. There's conditional, where they cause infections under certain, certain circumstances. This type is what most pathogenic bacteria are. And then there's opportunistic, um, they don't normally cause bacteria, but will if a patient has compromised immune system. Next slide. So now that we know more about pathogenic bacteria or pathogenic prokaryotes, we can actually dive into how they spread or pathogenic uh, mechanisms. So the first one is bacterial infectivity, which is a mechanism that pathogenic bacteria take to invoke their host with the disease. Uh, virulence factors, as well as toxins that we will go into more later in this presentation, as well as surface coats and surface receptors of that bacteria will allow them, re will allow them to reach their goal, which is to multiply as fast as they can so that they can infect more of the host body. Another mechanism, or rather a barrier for pathogenic bacteria that they need to overcome is the host resistance. Um, host resistance includes skin and iron, which is very important for their replication, as well as immunosuppressants. Immunosuppressants actually uh, 
mirosepetion, such as those who are in chemotherapy or have AIDS, are at an increased risk and also have an increased, increased risk for when they do contract them for life-threatening infections. Next slide. So pathogenic mechanisms continued. Uh, intracellular growth. During intracellular growth, bacteria multiply and grow in the host extracellular body fluids. Other times, bacteria won't penetrate body tissues, but rather stick to the epithelial body surface and secrete proteins that will inhibit those specific functions. Host-mediated pathogenesis occurs when the body basically cannot distinguish if the infection is bacterial or if it is a host immune response. Uh, this often occurs in gram-negative bacterial sepsis and tuberculosis as well. This will eventually lead to damaged tissues by lymphocytes and macrophages that were released from the body. And sometimes it's so potent it can destroy the host's healthy tissues and allow for the resistant bacteria to grow. Next slide. Here we have a list of um, diseases caused by um, pathogenic bacteria. Um, with all of these without proper medication, um, it often leads to death. Um, those mostly affected, as mentioned earlier, are usually developing countries. They lack access to medical care and proper hygiene for some of the cases. Um, each of these have a, a variety of virulence factors that have allowed them to succeed in their own way, um, whether that's the ability to transfer through fecal matter, physical touch, or even airborne. Um, it allows them to survive and affect as many people as possible. So virulence factors are how the pathogenic bacteria will cause these diseases to occur. Um, they allow bacteria to divide and survive inside the host. They allow the bacteria to resist the host immune attacks. And they also allow the bacteria to have the ability to damage their host. As said previously, each bacteria is going to have their own virulence factor, but each of them are going to be able to cause a type of illness by producing one of two toxins, either exotoxins or endotoxins. Next slide. Endotoxins are going to be lipopolysaccharide components on the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. They are very toxic and only release when the bacteria die and their cell walls break down. They are omnipresent in the environment, meaning they are everywhere. So endotoxins must be removed from all medical supplies destined for injection or use during surgical procedures. Um, it tends to be a scapegoat for all biological problems encountered in the laboratory, and it's mostly um, deserved of the profound biological effects it has on the host that may become lethal. Uh, for example, uh, salmonella typhi, it causes typhoid fever. Next slide. And then exotoxins, they are protein toxins that are released from viable bacteria of both gram positive and gram negative. Um, they are more dangerous than endotoxins as they can form a class of poisons that is among the most potent per unit weight of all toxic substances. Uh, most exotoxin activity is more localized and is confined to a particular cell type or a cell receptor instead of everywhere like endotoxins. Um, some common causes of exotoxins is that they stimulate hypersecretion of water and electrolytes from the intestinal epithelium. Um, they also cause abdominal cramping and decrease transit time for water absorption in the intestine. An example of this application is cholera, which is a dangerous diarrheal disease. Next slide. One of the most notorious pathogenic bacteria that has run rampant in the U.S. is um, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which is also known as MRSA. Um, at one point, antibiotics were the number one medicines given by doctors to treat virtually anything. Um, this resulted in resistance to antibiotics. Um, MRSA is a perfect example that evolved to be a um, notorious bacterial infection found in developed countries, um, often found in hospital settings. Uh, MRSA started as bacteria affected by antibiotics, but due to rapid evolution um, and adaptions, or adaptions were made and the strongest survived. Um, they passed on their traits uh, to their offspring that was resistant to um, the antibiotics that were being used. Um, some of these in, in, <laughs> included enzymatic degradation, um, 
modifying proteins in their DNA, allowing them to not be targeted by these drugs and um, changing their membrane permeability to the drugs so that they won't be um, affected. Santo uh, gene transfer. So with rapid reproduction of gene bacteria, the carrying resistant genes are usually unable to produce large populations through nat natural selection. Therefore, these genes can, sp can spread to others via the horizontal gene transfer instead. Um, it can also spread to uh, virulence related genes, which turns harmless bacteria into uh, really powerful pathogens. Um, an example of that is the E. coli, which is a harmless bacteria in human intestines. And when the potent uh, pathogen is added, the, then diarrhea can be caused to humans. Um, next slide. Um, when speaking on the dangerous types of pathogenic strains, O157H7 is the most dangerous kind. In the United States alone, it has been recorded about 75,000 cases of um, O157H7 per year. It usually contaminates beets or produce, which is very dangerous because a lot of people has access to it. Um, so scientists have attempted to compare the genome of O157H7 and the harmless genome E. coli mentioned before. And the results that they came out with is that uh, 1,387 out of 5,460 genes have no counterpart in K12. Uh, with that being said, at least 1,387 genes were incorporated into O157H7 through the horizontal gene transfer. Um, most genes in O157H7 um, are virulence associated and even enables the gene O157H7 to extract nutrients from the intestinal wall. Next slide. Um, epsilon proteobacteria is a subgroup of proteobacteria. The epsilon proteobacteria is a group known for its pathogenic bacteria, this bacteria is caused illness in animals as well as humans. Um, as we put our bacteria, are unicellular organisms of gram negative because these organisms are pathogenic. Um, most of the most of the relationships with their hosts are symbiotic, and their structure is composed of flagella or rod shape. Next. Cool. Another example is mycobacteria tuberculosis. So pretty sure everyone has heard of tuberculosis. It's a causative agent of tuberculosis. Um, Shape-wise, it has a bacillus shape. It's technically categorized as a gram positive, but it's a little bit unique, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Mainly, it affects the lungs, so transmission is through air droplets. Unfortunately for us humans, it has uh, very high levels of adaptability so that when it enters into the lungs, it's going to come in direct contact with the macrophages, which are going to consume the actual, um, the actual bacteria. Once it's consumed, it's going to enter this stage called latency, which is basically inactivity of the bacteria. And so the bacteria are actually going to be stuck in these um, chamber-like structures called granulomas. And then these bacteria usually aren't active unless the actual individual is immunocompromised. From there, they're gonna reactivate and infect the lung area, which is their main target. Uh, next, next slide. Yeah, so part two of it. Um, fortunately, the bacteria could appear in any part of the body. Um, it's uh, estimated that it can infect up to a third of the global population. Unfortunately, there is a high correlation between uh, tuberculosis and AIDS. Um, AIDS um, is the AIDS 
weaken the, the body's immune system. So if you have a weakened immune system, there is a higher chance that the mycobacterium tuberculosis will actually, um, it will actually be more effective of what they're doing because they're more active when you have a suppressed immune system. Luckily though, the body does have some mechanics to defend it, especially if you're a healthy individual. So you, it can induce apoptosis, which is basically cell death or phagocytosis, which consumes the mycobacterium in some cases. You also have your B cells and your CD4 T cells. Your B cells helps control the inflammation that could be caused by tuberculosis and your CD4 T cells are the ones that induce an immune response or tell the uh, B cells or communicate with the B cells to make antibodies. Uh, next. Another one. Uh, so pneumonia is an infection that inflame air sacs in the lungs and they can be usually filled with fluid or even pus. Um, a really common causative agent will be the streptococcus. Um, some of the symptoms can be chest pain, cough, fatigue, fever, nausea, shortness of breath, and many more. Um, the most effective preve prevention for pneumonia will be the two vaccines, which is the PCV-13 uh, and then the PPSV-23. Next slide. Um, helicobacter is an infectious disease present during the childhood of a person. Um, most people don't present symptoms, but it can cause peptal ulcers and inflammations in the stomach. This bacteria is transmitted from person to person via oral or in or unsanitary conditions. Antibiotics and antiacids are given combined to uh, treat the disease. Next. Uh, Capulobacter is also part of the epsilon proteobacteria subgroup. As an estimated of 1.5 million causes, uh, cases are reported per year in the U.S. This pathogenic bacteria is transmitted by animals or raw or undercooked food. Uh, Capulobacter causes symptoms like diarrhea, fever, and stomach cramps. Um, antibiotics treatment is usually not needed. Um, um, next slide. And here are resources. Um, thank you. Sorry, I'm trying to stop the record recording. <laughs>